it's crazy, but it's You're watching so Channel Z, the world's leading zombie apocalypse channel. It's something so Broadcasting cool. live from Studio Z. Makes me act the way I do. Welcome to Brain Dead Theater. I'm Liz Grumbach. I'm joining the conversation today from Phoenix, Arizona, where it is still somehow hotter than the surface of the sun. And I'm joined today by a couple of amazing colleagues. First, Athena Activist, our Channel Z producer and creator, is behind the scenes managing ground control today. Hi, Athena. Please make questions and comments on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter um, anywhere today. And Athena and our colleagues will make sure that those are uh, in conversation with our guests. It is also an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Alana Rain. Hi, Alana, how are you today? Hey, Liz, how's it hey, going? Yeah. Good, as my co-host, how is it over there in California? Well, the air is breathable today, mm -hmm. so that's good, and the temperature's mild, so no complaints. <laughs> that's awesome. It's much better than here in Arizona, actually. And then it's such an amazing pleasure to introduce our guest today, um, Larry Fessenden. Hi, Larry. Hey, guys. Nice Hi. to be here. It's so nice to be here. So Larry is an actor, a producer, a writer, a director, a film editor, a cinematographer. Um, it's so fantastic to have you here to talk about uh, discussing clips from several of the Glass Eye films, Glass Eye Picks films, um, which is, I think you're the founder of that New York-based independent production outfit. It's so cool to have you here to talk about these films today. And I think we're talking a little bit about like how zombies and apocalyptic settings help humanity face our collective fears. And I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about that today before we introduce our first clip. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I run a little company called Glass Eye Picks. We're an independent-based company uh, in New York City. And um, I've always contended that horror movies over the century, uh, you know, the 20th century and this one, uh, they really address the uh, societal fears. And you can track, you know, after the A-bomb was dropped, all the monsters turned into giant creatures that were, you know, from the atomic, uh, you know, hubris of humankind. So. I, I, my own films and the films I've produced tend to have that flavor. And so I just think it's really um, a great genre to express uh, societal anxieties. And uh, the clips I have for you guys today are uh, an example of that. They're from our uh, stable of films. And I think Alana might have been thinking a little bit about that as we, as we chatted um, about this yeah. episode. Yeah, Larry, um, I noticed in all the clips that the viewers are going to see soon, there's sort of a, there's a global theme about these where we're negotiating between cooperation and confrontation. And I would like to hear your thoughts uh, during the show about um, what you see as the role for, you know, perhaps an optimistic slant on filmmaking and um, all of those ramifications um, as we think about our future civilization and how we're negotiating it during the current apocalypse. So just to pin that for the show. Great. Well, I look forward to coming back to that because that's a, a real theme that's both in my films, but also in the way I conduct business. I run a community uh, where a bunch of artists and we're working together and sometimes you're the main guy, you're the director, and sometimes you work for the director. And it's, I really believe in, um, in serving uh, the group. And I try to treat my crew in a respectful way. And it's sort of an example of how we might run society. It's not the way we do run the society, unfortunately. But we should go to the clips. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense for our first clip, cooperation, community. Yeah, exactly. So this is a movie called Stay Clan. Um, it was directed by Jim Mickle, and I produced it along with my uh, pals. And um, it's a sprawling, apocalyptic film. We're going to come in quite early in the story, and we learn that there's a kid, um, and he's being mentored by a, a vampire hunter. You'll see these uh, creatures briefly, and they're vampires, but they feel like zombies. So this is kind of our zombie apocalypse film. Let's have a look, and then we'll talk. Stay clan, kid. Oh, 
passed in a blur of days and nights. We traveled east and west, but always north, away from death. We avoided the cities. Mister said they were the worst, hit the hardest in the beginning. As people flocked together for safety, the plague marched through their lock gates, and they became death traps. When Washington fell, it was over for America as we knew her. His government blew away. Our great leaders ran for it, and hope was abandoned. We were on our own now, me and Mister, traveling through a ruined land. Pockets of civilization survived. Towns locked down behind fences and guns, holding the night away. The cult spread like wildfire across the southern states, waiting for the Messiah, but he never came. Death came in its stead, and it came with teeth. I am such a fan of this film, and I wonder if maybe we could talk a little bit before we move on with our conversation about what it's like to live in a world where our leaders have failed us, um, where hope is hard to find. Yeah, I mean, this movie is uh, seems appropriate for our time. I always like to say that I think artists and and horror films often in general uh, have a feeling of prescience because they. They seem to anticipate things that are going to go wrong. Well, that's kind of their stock and trade to talk about uh, where the world could start to collapse. And in this movie, it is a, a virus that creates vampires, and and you see how people fracture. And there's kind of a, a Christian element where they're trying to control the zombies and, and terrorize the, the characters. But it's also a story about uh, building families uh, and this small group of people who are fighting the monsters and, the, um, and just trying to survive. So it, it's an appropriate story about the lengths you have to go to and how you have to find camaraderie. And this is a mentorship as well between the older guy, Mr. and, and the kid. I, I absolutely love that. And I think this, this, um, this urge to find community, right? Especially when we, are all maybe feeling now, and especially in the movie, there's these 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 moments of about to give upness, right? Um, and I I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit more before we move on to the next film, which I think is it also has those themes. Yeah, I mean it. These kind of movies, when you're struggling against impossible odds, uh, you know, you need to be have a goal, uh, some sort of sense of hope, and and the. The sense of community, for example, one of the characters becomes pregnant, and there's always that sense of the rebirth. Uh, another character finds a, a girlfriend, and, and maybe they'll find a future together. But there's this this endless feeling of despair, and right when you you've got set up something, then the zombies come come back. So or the vampires. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's really about. The, the struggle and you know they're always trying it's funny they're trying to get to Canada um, which is their idea of the new Eden so uh, it's all the familiar uh, stories that we all sort of cling to which is the feeling that there is a way out of uh, the, the current disaster and obviously with COVID we're feeling a need to uh, envision a brighter future. Larry, so, we have a question from the audience. Um, uh, one of our representatives at Studio Z is is asking, you know, if horror movies reflect sort of current social anxieties, um, what is what are we going to see after the pandemic in terms of monsters and horror icons? Well, that's always a big question, and you know, they've already rushed some COVID stories uh, through, and I, I always. Uh, well, I have a friend who points out, you know, maybe it's a little too fast to digest the real feelings of COVID. I also would argue that COVID is unfortunately uh, a horror movie that we're living because, you know, you think of The Shining, that's about isolation and going crazy. You think of uh, uh, even the movie The Thing, you don't know who's got the uh, the thing inside them. Uh, so, the and then, you know, even the Planet of the Apes series at the end of that, if you remember, the, this is one of the remakes, but... Um, uh, you see that the virus is catching and then films like Contagion. So, you know, these are things that humans are naturally afraid of and that's what uh, 
Hollywood's been making the big bucks off of. All the zombie movies are about the collapse of society. How are we going to function? Uh, so it's an interesting question how we'll process COVID, but horror movies have been talking about this for uh, decades, quite honestly. <laughs> and and just related to that, since um, I totally agree with you, I actually think it is too soon to be creating art based on something we're in the middle of, personally, as a filmmaker myself. But uh, since you're based in New York and we know um, the devastating losses that New York faced. And, um, you know, I was just there visiting and watching the empty streets. So I'd be curious how you felt as, as an artist, as a creator, walking through what so many people in, you know, common lexicon was like, it's like the apocalypse. I mean, it was just a refrain I heard over and over again. Like, personally, how did you feel living in that? <laughs> the landscape? answer is, is, is uh, a little bit, revealing of myself but uh, my friends will laugh uh as i always say on my tombstone it'll say i told you so because uh i i walked through it and i was like exactly this is what i've been saying you know i really feel uh because i'm a um i'm alarmed by the potential uh violence the potential uh de degradation of society and uh, so i feel it acutely uh, even in the sort of microaggressions. So I've always anticipated the apocalypse. To be living it is so disappointing and claustrophobic. And ironically, that's how I feel about uh, climate change. Um, I made a movie about climate change, which I think will clip next. And, and the point is, is that I take it very personally because it makes me feel claustrophobic. You know, at the end of uh, many movies, there's the sense of, well, tomorrow's another day. But imagine if that was taken from us and you really couldn't trust the future. You know, you couldn't escape. You know, I'm going to leave society. This has all been terrible. I'm going to go somewhere far away. But with climate change, you can't escape. And then if you have a child, as I do, you, what are you going to tell them that their future is? So these are the issues that I try to express. They're personal issues. Of course, they become political. Uh, and that's what uh, the next clip will indicate. It's two scenes, though they're butted together, uh, where you see uh, different points of view, basically. Uh, it's an oil drilling operation gone to the very uh, northern climes, uh, the Anwar, which is the um, Alaskan uh, wildlife refuge, where they're not supposed to drill, but Trump has opened it, by the way. Um, and this is what happens to them. And uh, these are just a couple little scenes. Uh, and then we can chat quickly about it. It's the CO2 feeding back up as the ground warms. Permafrost, all this organic material that's been frozen for thousands of years, is thawing, which accelerates the warming. It's, it's exponential what we're talking about here. What is this? Um Global warming bullshit. I mean, don't you think it's a little late in the day to be having that particular debate? It's not a debate about global warming, Ed. It's just what we're dealing with out here now. Yeah, well, fortunately, I don't have to listen to you anymore. You asked. Just making conversation. Empathy with the land. Is this learned in childhood? changed. The biosphere turned, become unfamiliar and erratic. I would say vengeful that nature's indifferent to us. We fight for our survival, not nature's. There's a fierceness in the wind I've never felt before. Something is being unleashed from the softening permafrost. Why we despise the world that gave us life? Why so alienated? Why wouldn't the wilderness fight us? Like any organism would fend off a virus. The world we grew up in is changed forever. There is no way home. Is there something beyond science that is happening out here? What if the very thing we were here to pull out of the ground were to rise willingly and confront us? What would that look like? Mm -hmm. 
This is the last winter. Total collapse. Hope dies. <laughs> so I think I, what would be, yeah, hope dies. Yeah. Um, I, I think this creeping sense of dread, this horror movie that we are living, as you said earlier, right, um, is so important here. And I'm thinking this line, there is no way home, paired with a line that I know is later in the movie that is something along the lines of, I just hope this isn't happening everywhere else, yeah. right, um, is something that hit me, hits me really hard about this film because this is happening everywhere else. This creeping sense of dread is something that we are all going through, right? Yeah, I appreciate you especially quoting that other line because uh, this is a movie about um, <clears throat> if you can't escape from uh, this predicament, which is climate change, you know, there is no where you can go. You know, there's always the idea of leaving society if you have terrible problems or if there's war or carnage. There's this notion that you, there's somewhere you could go to get away, but not if the... Uh, climate itself is is changing. So it's a movie about that old cliche, you can never go home, which implies something much more personal. You know, you can't really get back to your childhood, but imagine you can't go home, meaning you can't go back to the, the weather, the climate. I, I'm very lucky to be in the East Coast right now, and we are having fall weather, but it's, it's always, it's been different for five years, and it's weird. That's why I wonder when somebody like Trump, he's what, 70, five years old, doesn't even notice that the weather's different. Uh, it's just, do you not take it personally? Are you not even aware of these things? Obviously the fires in California, surely uh, there's always been fires, but never to this uh, vicious degree. Always been storms, but never to this degree. So it's that claustrophobia of feeling you can't escape. And I tried to capture uh, that. And idea. I think that's really relevant just briefly, that it, knowing that there's no place to go in a way that forces us into a cooperation. You know, I think as humans, we, and as parents particularly say, okay, I've got to flee. I've got to leave. I've got to protect my tribe. But if everyone's having that thought, then why don't we all just say, okay, well, there's nowhere to go. Let's figure this out. I, I, I love this theme that, that um, we're touching on of cooperation. In fact, I think we should just zip right on to the next uh, clip and then we can, you know, finish up our conversation and really uh, dig into that theme because the next film, I think all my movies and the ones that I've produced tend to be about uh, cooperation and, uh, and when you're pushed to the breaking point, um, can you find the resources, the personal and the you know, the group resources to, to cooperate and save yourselves. And my question is, can humanity do that? And with COVID, we're being asked that question. We're dealing with that question every day. Um, so this is a small B film called Beneath. Uh, it was written by someone else, but I did a polish and then I directed it. And I had a group of uh, kids in a, in a rowboat uh, on, a, on a lake and um, a giant fish comes and starts attacking the boat. And so they have to figure out what to do. And it becomes a story uh, very precisely about cooperation in the face of a, um, a terrible uh, problem. And I always joked this was really my metaphor for uh, the American Congress. And this was made eight years ago when Congress was trouble, but not as bad as it is now. So let's watch a clip from Beneath, and then we can get back and really talk about the idea of cooperation and horror and COVID. <laughs> Let's face it, the only thing that worked is when it was preoccupied with Deb's body and it's not gonna let us move. We so. don't have any extra dead bodies on hand, do we, Einstein? I know that, okay? So what, what, are you volunteering to get in the lake to create a diversion? No. Okay, then what's your point? No, but I'm not gonna do that because I'm the weakest one and you guys all know that. I mean, I don't stand a chance fighting that thing. Oh, so maybe someone more athletic should do it? Like, uh, my brother or me? No. Johnny is the one who got us into this situation. I'm just saying. Shut up, just all of you just shut up. I'm just saying that I think we should vote.
Boat sinking, kitty. We're gonna die if we do nothing. Or we can save some of us. We can make some choices. Just we vote on one person to to volunteer for the sake of the boat. Matt, cut it out. We vote now. And Johnny, since you're the one who got us into this, who do you think should go first? Cut oh hell, Matt. Hey, Zeke, why don't why don't you volunteer? Huh? Oh, wait, no, wait a second. No, it was your idea, pal. Okay, this is how this thing should work, okay? Each of us should get to make a, um, like, a case for ourselves. A case? Yes, like a case for why we should stay on the boat. This is insane! Kitty, I want to live, okay? I want us to live. The hell with you, Matt! No, this is not how Kitty. we do things! No, we stick together! Don't touch me! We should be bailing or, or using something else to row! Johnny, you should have told us! You really should have told us. Stay away from me, Matt. Kitty! Okay, Matt, Matt, Matt. Okay, 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 okay. We vote. I vote for Zeke. No, I get to make my case first, okay? That's such an intense scene, I have to say, you know, and as like somebody who studies cooperation and conflict, like it's clear, right? They're just framing this whole thing in terms of, you know, seeing the possibility of conflict among them, as opposed to really noticing that their interests are fundamentally aligned and seeing the potential for benefit from using their brains together, using their bodies together, right? Like they're, they're just in this frame of mind that is making them stuck, right? They're, I mean, they're literally in the same boat together, right? We use that like metaphor. There they are in the same boat, but they just, they can't wrap their heads around it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the movie just gets more and more appalling as they uh, start bringing up old grievances from the prom and this kind of thing. And you're just like, my God, people. Uh, and I think what's sad about American society now is because of our uh, media environment, you know, it's become more profitable and more inflammatory to divide uh, people into camps, into tribes, and to actually, uh, the idea of cooperation has fallen out of fashion. Even uh, if you're a lefty or if you're on the right, um, you get rid of the people who want to um, cooperate in Congress, uh, you know. So uh, we become more and more extreme through social media. You know, there's a movie I just saw uh, that points out that um, on social media, you know, if you look at one video, they send you increasingly more uh, extreme versions of that. And that's how you end up with QAnon and these other uh, extreme things becoming, uh, moving into the mainstream. When I was young in the 70s, there was this whole aesthetic of uh, reaching across the aisle. It was part of, and then, you know, even the Bushes would talk about humility as part of their platform. That's all out the window. And this is the direct result of a society that has um, fetishized and weaponized uh, the idea of division. And so this is where my sense of, uh, uh, you know, the idea of the mask debate is once again, just like beneath, uh, there, there's a clear and present uh, problem out there. And we even have some very cheap solutions, like a $6 solution. Uh, and yet uh, people have politicized it. So this is unfortunately the demise of society. And we talked about what would be the movies of the future. Well, it would be the, I think, movies about mistrust and um, and not knowing the truth, which is a theme actually I have worked on before. As I say, my vampire movie habit is about a guy who thinks his girlfriend's a vampire, but maybe he's an alcoholic. It's kind of hard to say. So I just think um, those are the real dangers. And optimism is just wishing people not would accept my facts, I'm sort of past that, but just would come down to the aesthetic of trying to get along and make solutions together. I mean, I find that aesthetically more interesting. I think compromise is something we should celebrate. Larry, Erica had this question a little earlier, we didn't have the chance to get to, um, about hope and how do we actually deal with this sense of hopelessness that is starting to pervade society now? I feel very strongly that we can't now fetishize hopelessness. Uh, you know, I always say we may, you know, funnily enough, I didn't, you know, if you're in a boat and there's a hole in the boat, you still bail, 
you may it may be hopeless, but you bail because it's something to do, and it gives you a sense of purpose, and maybe it will help. And that's how I feel about climate change. You know, people love to say, "Well, we can fix up our house," but the Chinese are going to ruin everything. It's like, listen, let's why don't we show some spine? Let's see if we can get along and cooperate, make some solutions. We'll feel good even as we go down the tubes, as opposed to what? Just, you know, partying like it's 1999. I mean, that is an option, but I think it's, a, it's it, you know, this is where you come back to upbringing and, and, you know, the whole culture is into this sort of victimization and defeatism and, you know, anger, anger, anger. These are all easier emotions than cooperation. I would argue that cooperation requires poise, you have to suppress your ego, you have to suppress your selfishness, and you have to work for the group. And that takes effort. So I reject the idea that, um, you know, it's a tough, tough man that can divide the nation. That's not tough. That's weak. That's my real premise. That's what I would like to uh, do, challenge people. And so you're challenging them to be helpful. <laughs> Great. We have a, another question here from Pam, um, Pam Winfrey. She's say, she says, you know, the more that people fear, um, the more people do become selfish and self-centered. What's the way out of that rut? Well, for one thing, I do want to say that's why I make horror movies, because I think, and I've said this for years, that fear is the overriding emotion. Um, I've always been afraid of the dark, afraid that someone's going to come and kill me, afraid of werewolves and the scary moon. Um, but I've also embraced that and understood that about myself. I hate flying. I hate a lot of things. I don't like COVID either. Um, but you try to center yourself and find a way forward. And I feel like we need a society that will nurture that uh, part of us that, and, and also accept that fear is something we live with. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's a very natural state. And to try to deny it and think that if I buy more shampoo or if I have a yacht, I won't have fear, that's already a mistake. That's where commercialism has distorted our minds for 50 years, 100 years. It's been a very deliberate, slowly, if you buy this iPad, you will uh, somehow keep off death. That's not true. We should, we should accept death. And we, you know, even that, America's afraid of uh, death as well. And so... And I don't mean death in terms of the numbers of COVID. I mean, you know, just being unable to confront the realities of, of life. And one of those realities is, oh, there's a virus. How do we deal with it? I don't want to talk about science. Of course, we have to listen to science. But there's also a philosophy that says, okay, you know what? We can deal with reality. We have enough uh, balls. <laughs> Fear. Face everything Fear and reality. recover. <laughs> What you mm -hmm. say? Uh, it said fear can be face everything and recover or F everything and run. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> gonna get Christina Bashu is, is saying here that, you know, the, the arts have this power to bring people together to actually, you know, embody cooperation often. How can we make use of that as we're grappling with the challenges of today? Well, there are two things. I mean, making art is really valuable. My wife is making masks for her friends and she's making these beautiful things. She's in, you know, living in that moment. Um, but also I, I have a small company. It's mostly because I'm a failure, but I do uh, believe in the smaller company and not spending all your time barking up to Hollywood's tree, you know, hoping, hoping, hoping. Art is, is rejuvenating and you must own it for yourselves and work with your community and, and uh, do stuff that makes you feel um, uh, empowered. And that's all part of creativity. And, you know, we, we, once again, we measure everything by success. If you're famous, if you, if you're rich, uh, but actually art can be so much more for people. And as for real movies, I think they still are trying to tell stories of redemption. You know, even the Marvel movies are, you know, usually about working together, the, the Hulk and the, the other guys. <laughs> I freaked out. I thought we were finished. And I am talking too much, but I get one again. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks so much, Leah. I dropped out for a minute, but I just wanted to just say, I know you might have mentioned it, but I know that you are working on kind of a web project to discuss some of these things and to present some of these ideas. And I wondered if you wanted to introduce that before we end. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, I mean, it's a side project because once again, I really don't want to get into a Twitter war with somebody, but I do have a place where I put out some thoughts about these sort of more political issues. Um, it's called disconnects.com. There it is uh, written down there. And it's, I wrote it in the um, 2016. It wasn't because of Trump, but that's when I started it and I published it. I've always tried to have sort of a website that deals with climate change and it's just trying to be open about these questions and trying to lay sort of a history. And also I feel because we're disconnected from nature and from each other and from our work, you know, this is the problem with automation. I mean, we need to be connected. It is what we've been talking about this half hour uh, is, is connection between people, but also with nature and a sense of reverence and humility towards the gloriousness. I mean, you know, if you need to call it a God, so be it, but I'm telling you, there's something bigger than yourself. Um, and if you had humility about that, you wouldn't be endlessly trying to achieve power in the human world, which is what uh, you see in uh, our politics. It's all about power and not about uh, uh, humility. So whatever, Disconnects just proposes some questions and, and lays out some history, I think, where you try to connect the dots uh, between uh, why we're here, you know, between commercialism and capitalism and, uh, and climate change and too much plastic. That's really, really inspiring, Larry. And, and we're lucky, uh, culture is lucky to have artists like you and filmmakers. Oh, really well, you too. And thanks to all you guys for what you're doing, which is cool. And uh, doing science with a, a creative angle is, is really great. I mean, I'm appreciative that this is happening. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show, Larry. It was it was great to have you. I just want to remind everybody that if you like what we're doing on Channel Z, that we um, have a lot of shows. You can go to our website and see them all. And um, we're also having a online live interactive meeting, the zombie apocalypse medicine meeting. Um, and you can get more information about that at channelz.org. Um, it's going to be happening October 15th through 18th and um you'll get to see a little bit more of larry there too so um so definitely if you if you like what you see check us out and um subscribe to us on youtube um follow us on twitter and on facebook and uh we will look seeing look forward to seeing all of you at zam thank you thank you bye guys bye, bye everybody